We'll turn to the word. And um, those of you who know me, you know, know that I'm a dog lover. And, uh, you know, my, I would love one day to have a, you know, to be a pastor of a dog-friendly church where people could just bring their dogs and they could be a part of the service and run up and down the aisles. And that would make me really, really happy. You know, in fact, I would just go out and play with the dogs and someone else could. But anyway, so because of the dog, this caught my eye, but it's not really about dogs. I don't know if you can read that, but um, don't worry. It's super intuitive. The user will know how to use it. And there's the user. And really, that's, that user is kind of me in a lot of areas. You know, some people, you know, talk about different sorts of uh, software and so it's real intuitive, you know, it's just, it's intuitive, you can figure it out, just, just play around with it. It's not intuitive for everyone, okay? There are some things that even when my, like, my boys explain some things, I mean, I, honestly, when I do things like with the boys, we play games or something, I can, I can kind of hear their exasperation. In fact, even they write things, you know, dad needs help again, you know, Brendan, why don't you go and help dad and help him to figure it out because it's not intuitive. A lot of things are not necessarily intuitive to everyone. And one of those things that are not necessarily intuitive is the Bible, okay? To understand the Bible rightly sometimes takes some work, some focus in learning how to handle the Word of God correctly. And so last week we kind of began to talk about that. Um, we, we talked about um, training yourself for godliness and so forth. By the way, I, I sort of gave a little assignment at the end of the sermon last Sunday about maybe talk to some other people in the body about how they have trained themselves for godliness. Maybe if there's some spiritual disciplines that someone else has practiced, talk to them about that, find out what that is, maybe practice that. Um, do I dare ask, did, did anyone actually do that last week? Okay, a couple people did. Good job. You, you guys get tens. The rest of you get zeros. So that's, that's not a very good grade curve there. <clears throat> but the point is there's, there's things you can actually do, things we can actually do to train ourselves for godliness and things we can do in order to understand and use the word um, better. And this is one of the reasons why starting next week, we're starting this ser um, series of sermons on the book of Revelation. So last week and this week, the sermons were kind of more topical. But starting next week, we're going to go a little more carefully and systematically through the book of Revelation. And, and one of the reasons we're going to do that is because, especially in times of... Um, you know, a lot of change in the world or problems in the world. Christians, and the Christians have done this for pretty much 2,000 years of church history, gone to the book of Revelation, because you look at Revelation and there's all this stuff happening, catastrophe, and maybe the book of Revelation will kind of decode for us what's going on in the world. And so that's been going on recently, but there are healthy ways to read and understand and apply the book of Revelation, and there are some ways that I think are less healthy. And so we're going to kind of look at that, and, and, and I hope, even if your thinking is going to be challenged a little bit, that we will see actually how simple and practical the basic central message of the book of Revelation is. But it takes some work and some thought, and it takes using your head. And last Sunday, we kind of ended with this passage from 2 Timothy, and we're thinking more again about Paul, the mentor, and um, the words of advice that he was giving to Timothy, a younger man who is facing struggles in his ministry, and Timothy is try or Paul is trying to help Timothy sort through and find, you know, greater success in his ministry. But at the end of 2 Timothy, Paul says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. These are no doubt very emotional words for Paul. Okay, this is, he, he knows his end is coming soon. He's writing from prison, from a Roman prison, and he's pretty much figured out he's not getting out of prison. Okay, and if he's not getting out of prison, you know, they don't have, you know, Romans or anyone in the ancient world didn't give life sentences in prison. You were in prison until they set you free or they executed you. 
Paul knows he's going to lose his head literally, literally, probably in less than a year. And so he's, you know, he's no doubt thinking or very emotional as he says these words to Timothy. But he says, preach the word. Like I said last week, these are specific words to Timothy. We don't all of us have the same kind of obligation to preach that Timothy had. Yeah, yet we do have obligations in the kingdom of God. But Paul says, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. And I talked about that last week because this is, this is kind of our times, especially for the church. You know, it's not always convenient anymore. Um, you know, back when we could not meet together, like meeting together by Zoom, that's not a convenient, I mean, it's in one sense convenient. You stay at home, you can go to church in your pajamas, that kind of thing. You know, you can switch off the, your screen and go use the toilet or whatever. But in other ways, it wasn't, it wasn't a convenient way to do church, to have Zoom or something. And it was, I, I found during that period, it got harder and harder to preach to a camera. I mean, earlier I could do it. I've had to do a lot of talking to a camera and recording, and it got harder. And by the end of that process, I, I was trying to record some things, and I just kept making mistakes that I never would make before speaking. It was just not convenient. But Paul says, whether it's convenient for you or not, there's things you have to do. So do it. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Careful instruction. For the time is going to come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. <clears throat> now, like I said last week, you know, especially when we think about the book of Revelation, some people read the book of Revelation and they think, okay, it's all in the future and things are going to get worse and worse. And people look at what's going on now and they think it's getting worse and worse. And, and it was as bad 2,000 years ago as it is today. Okay, Paul is not talking about something that's going to happen at the end of the age. Paul is talking about something that's going on in his world and Timothy's world where people are not going to put up with sound doctrine. People who once did. He's not talking about the average pagan, okay, on the streets of Ephesus or the streets of Rome. He's talking about church people who once upon a time were willing to listen to careful instruction from the Bible, but now they've gotten bored with that and they want some kind of message that is more interesting to them. So they're going to not put up with sound doctrine anymore. Instead, to suit their own desires, they're going to gather around a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Certainly now you know that there's a marketplace of ideas out there and you can find thousands of different teachers you know, on the internet. You know, it's, it's very easy to do that, and you could, just a little work, you can find someone who's going to say exactly what you want them to say, and whatever you believe, you can find someone who will confirm your beliefs. It's pretty easy to do. It's actually, even back then, in the early church, there were lots of options available. Okay? And so they're going to find the teacher that suits them for whatever reason, and their ears, they're going to turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, whatever those might be, some other kind of teaching. <clears throat> but Paul says, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. It's not going to be easy. Okay. Keep your head in all situations. And that's kind of what we're thinking about uh, this morning is keeping our head. Uh, that's kind of a paraphrase of what, what Paul said. I mean, more literally, the idea is be sober. But Paul isn't talking, you know, literally not under the influence of alcohol. Chemically, he's saying, you know, like if you're under the influence of, of alcohol, you're, you don't have your head. You're not in control of everything that you're doing. You're not necessarily in control of yourself completely. You don't see straight and you can't think straight. And Paul is saying, don't be like that. You know, like a drunk person who's not in control of what's going on in their head, you need to keep your head so you can think carefully and be in control of your behavior. Don't lose your head. Keep your head in any kind of situation. And it's especially critical now in light of world events. We need to be the people who keep our heads. 
And I, I, I'm just going to keep emphasizing, it's really going to be a theme in the book of Revelation, that this is a time when people are looking at Christians and how we are reacting. And I, I heard about a, another case in the world in, in another, um, another country where an area that hadn't uh, had uh, many cases of COVID, they suddenly spiked because of a religious community that was gathering together, not taking any kind of precautions and going out into the stores. And so the religious community infected the larger community. Okay. That's not the only time that's happened. People are looking at Christians right now and we need to keep our heads, okay? For the sake of Jesus Christ, we need to keep our heads. So Paul says, keep your head Think carefully. Don't let your circumstances control you. Don't put your hands up in despair. I mean, that's the danger of thinking everything is getting so bad, the world is falling apart. And one of the messages of, of church history, and it's going to be one of the messages of Revelation, is that actually nothing is changing. Nothing has changed. The world has always been facing these kind of crises. It's nothing new that we are experiencing in the last six months. I mean, it's new to my life. I've not really experienced this, but people through history have experienced these things. And so now we don't need to put up our hands and like, now suddenly God has lost control of the world. Okay, and again, message of revelation is God has never lost control of the world. It's always been in his hands and it always will be. So we, his people, we need to keep our heads during this time. This theme that Paul ends with in 2 Timothy, it really, he started with that in the first letter that he wrote to Timothy. So he says, as I urge you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus. So Timothy had been a companion of Paul, and Timothy had learned a lot from Paul. And as Paul often did, as he moved on somewhere, he would leave one of his trusted associates to kind of keep things going and to oversee some things and, and that kind of thing. And so Paul moved on from Ephesus, but he left Timothy, you know, to kind of keep his eye on the churches there to help out, to use his gifts of teaching and so forth, to make sure the churches didn't start to, you know, turn here and there and the things that he's, Paul is worried about. So Timothy was left in Ephesus. So Paul says, that, so that you can command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. He says, these things, such things promote controversial speculations, and they don't advance God's word, work. Of course, I, just again, this is happening all the time about what's going on in the world, and there's this conspiracy and this conspiracy, and, and I want to ask, what's, what's your evidence? Where did, why, where did you get that? How do you know that's true? Well, I, you know, so-and-so said, so-and-so said this, and it's, it's speculation. If you've got facts, then put the facts out. If you don't have facts, then the speculation is not helping the work of God. Okay, so we need to keep our heads. Sorry, I'm kind of preaching stronger than I meant to this morning. I apologize. That wasn't my intention. Um, but in any case, um, speculations do not advance God's work, which is by faith. Paul says the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. Once upon a time, good conscience, sincere faith. But, but now they've walked away from that. And they turn to this meaningless talk. And they want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. And, and verse 8 there is really important because, you know, we, you know, the implication obviously is it's, it's possible to use the law or anything in the Bible improperly. Okay, there's a proper way to use scripture, but there's an improper way to use it. And just because it's based on scripture, if it's an improper way to use scripture, you're not finding truth. Okay, the law is good if it's used properly. Okay, the word is good if it's used properly. If the word is used improperly, it can be deadly. I'll mention in a moment, literally deadly. So 
So Paul starts all this advice to Timothy in these two letters over the course of many months when he's writing these letters. And the, that's, this theme kind of runs through First and Second Timothy, the importance of standing firm in the truth, knowing the truth, keeping your head, thinking carefully. Um, and so again, I'm, I'm, I was going to read a couple other uh, uh, passages from First Timothy just to give that example, but I want to kind of keep going and hopefully I won't preach too long. Um, but this is, this is very important to Paul at the end of his life, you know, that, that there be a solid foundation of truth that's built on the Word of God, okay, and, and everything else needs to be built on that truth, because it's not built on that foundation, then it's going to fall away, and, you know, in falling down might indeed crush some people. <clears throat> So all through First and Second Timothy, there's an emphasis on the Word. For instance, Paul tells Timothy, you know, read the Word. In church, when you're gathered, read Scripture. Give yourself to the public reading of Scripture. So the people, every, every time they meet, at least once a week, you know, they're hearing Scripture. They're reading Scripture. That's especially important to them because most people didn't have a copy of their own Bible. A lot of people couldn't even read. You know, they certainly didn't have their own copy of the Bible, so they had to gather where someone could read to them Scripture. We are fortunate people. All of you know how to read, I'm pretty sure. I imagine all of you have a copy of the Bible at least available. If you don't have a copy of the Bible and you need one, then certainly talk to me or someone here, and we can get one into your hands as, as soon as possible. Okay, but we need Scripture. We need our minds be filled with Scripture. It's one of the ways that we keep our heads. And another thing that Paul does in First and Second Timothy is, besides talking about the importance of Scripture, he, he occasionally will sort of give these summaries of Christian doctrine. There were probably er, early church creeds, just a couple lines that were just central truths that the first churches believed, and he puts them in these letters as if to say to, as if to, say to Timothy, hold on to these. Okay, I mentioned last week, you know, there are gray areas, and the, the older I get, the, the more gray areas I see. I mean, I, I have fewer answers now than I had 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I, I, honestly, I thought I had answers, the right answers, to most important questions. Okay, now that I'm a little older, I'm like, I'm not quite so certain. Okay, there's, there's a lot of gray areas, at least to me. Okay, and that might make some people uncomfortable, but that's, I, I think there's a lot of gray areas, but it's precisely because there are gray areas that we need to hold on to what is clear. You know, there are some things that are black and white, so we need to make sure we know what those white things are so we can hold on to those so that we can, you know, navigate our way through these gray areas. We have something solid to hold on to, you know, in the midst of kind of floating on this sea that's not so solid. So it's because gray areas exist that Paul reminds Timothy, hold on to these central truths, okay, fix your mind on, they're really pretty basic. They are, I mean, they're just a couple lines in First and Second Timothy, and they're the most basic things, but hold on to those, and anything else that you hear, put it alongside these central truths, and if these other ideas don't match these central truths, then you need to just, you know, flush those other tr ideas away. <clears throat> now, one of the critical things about what Paul is saying here to Timothy is that all of this teaching that he's talking about, this false teaching or dangerous teaching, or if it's not necessarily false, it's just speculation, or it's unimportant things, fringe ideas, and that kind of thing, all of that that is in Paul's mind is coming from within the church. He's not talking about pagan teachers out there. There are a lot of them as well. In, in, you know, in, in the ancient world, it was a marketplace of ideas. Literally, you could go to the marketplace, and there might be anyone from who knows where who's standing up and giving some kind of a talk. There's plenty of ideas, all sorts of philosophies, religious philosophies, other kind of philosophies. There are plenty of ideas available. Paul is especially concerned about false teaching that is coming from within the church, and that means it's, it might sound spiritual and people might be quoting the Bible. In fact, they almost certainly will be quoting the Bible. But just because they're quoting the Bible doesn't necessarily mean it is true. Like Paul said, the law is good if, if it's used properly. 
it's used improperly, then it can be actually dangerous. So again, it might be teaching that sounds very spiritual, and it might be new, and some, unfortunately, we're often attracted to something that's new. I've never heard that before. That's so cool, and let's, let's go after that because this is new and fresh, and I'm, we're a little bit bored with the same old thing. You know? And so there's that danger of just finding some kind of new teaching um, just because we're bored with the old. Timothy was sent to Ephesus, Before Paul uh, left Ephesus for the last time, he met with the elders of that church. This is recorded in Acts chapter 20. And he kind of gives his final speech to the elders of the church in Ephesus, reminds them of what he's done and and what's going on and so forth. And, And this is what Paul told to the leaders. These were leaders that Paul appointed in those churches. But Paul said, I know that after my departure... Fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Again, these are going to be false teachers that are going to come into the church, try to steal the sheep to the sheep's destruction. But Paul says, And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things and draw away disciples after them. So Paul already knew human nature, and even, even with Christian leaders, he knew what could happen. You know, and there's maybe all sorts of different reasons it can happen, why leaders kind of take a turn that's not good and then gather people to their own teaching and maybe want to puff themselves up or whatever. But, but Paul already knew there might be dangers in the church at Ephesus. So he's left Timothy there, and, and Timothy is now facing that. So some of this false teaching might be coming from men that Paul had appointed um, to be elders in that church, but they've kind of gone off the rails, so to speak. And I mean, you can imagine why it's hard for Timothy. I mean, Timothy is probably struggling here because it's like, oh my goodness, here's this guy who's older than I am, and, and Paul, my mentor, ordained him, and I got to go to this guy and say, you need to shut up because your teaching is false. I mean, I'm glad I didn't have Timothy's job. I mean, my job here is, as stressed as I get, is so much easier than Timothy's job. But this is, this is just the reality. This false teaching he's talking about that's coming within the church, and it might sound spiritual, it might sound biblical, but we have to keep our heads. And we need to think. We need to think. So last week and this week, I've been talking about some of these things that we are now facing, and one of them is just changes and challenges in the world. You know, I mean, one of the challenges has been COVID. Certain other places in the world have other kinds of of challenges, but generally, there's just always changes, but all of our lives have changed drastically the last six to eight months. You know, like I said, plans, um, you know, plans that were made, you know, back in January and February. I was talking to someone who was you know, talking about being baptized and getting married, uh, you know, soon was that person's idea. Well, that didn't happen, you know, and I don't even know what's happened. I don't even know what's going on in that relationship. I, you know, I mean, that's a great plan, but boy, that plan hasn't happened yet. Okay, that's just, this is the reality, and change is, change is the norm. The one thing that doesn't change is that change is always going to happen, you know, and so that's why last week we were talking about we need to train ourselves to be ready for whatever happens. We are the kind of people who are prepared. So there's these changes and challenges in the world. And then, it's like I've talked about, there are some gray areas in life. You know, there, we have some problems or issues in the contemporary world that they didn't have 2,000 years ago. You know, and so we have to figure out what is the responsible Christian way to respond to something respond to something that the Bible doesn't talk about directly. You know, I mean, the whole thing of electronics and social media and that kind of thing, you know, Paul didn't give us a single word about social media. You know, he didn't have a clue. If we tried to explain it to Paul, he would think we were those, you know, false teachers. You know, he, the Bible doesn't talk about that, but as Christians, we've got to find a way to figure that out based on what the Bible says, and it's not necessarily black and white. So there are gray areas, and because there are gray areas, you know, we need to find the solids. And one of the dangers of gray areas 
is that some people get very uncomfortable with gray areas, and so they look for the kind of teacher who can answer all their questions, and they have it all figured out in a system. Okay? And this is why some people get pulled to certain kind of teachers, because you can find someone who, this is really going to be true in the book of Revelation, because you're going to find some teachers that have the complete scheme, and you've seen you know, these big charts, and it all lays out exactly how it's going to happen week by week, and it all seems to fit, okay? I, I'm going to challenge that, okay? And I'm not going to be able to answer every question that you have about the book of Revelation. It's not an, an, an easy book to understand necessarily, and I get skeptical of people who have everything figured out, okay? Um, but there are gray areas, and then there's false teachers. Paul is especially concerned about false teachers. Um, in this day and age, I'm not quite as concerned about false teachers, though I think there's plenty of them that are available. But sometimes it's just bad ideas. Okay, it might be good people, but good people can have bad ideas. Okay? I mean, in America now, things are so divided, but even among Christians, there's lots of different views about things, political things and other things, and they can't all be right. Someone has some bad idea there. They might be good people, but they can't all be right. Some of those ideas some, seem to be pretty bad, and just we need to acknowledge that, that there's a lot of bad ideas that good people have. I mean, I, I hope I'm a good person. You can judge that. I hope I'm not an idiot, but I, I might have some bad ideas occasionally. In fact, I know I have, because I you know, I teach some things now that I didn't teach 20 years ago. I, I, I hope I know better now than I did, but it must mean that 20 years ago I had some bad ideas. And some of you have known me that long, and you've heard some of my bad ideas, and I apologize. You know, I hope you will sort out some of my previous bad ideas, you know, and say, sorry, we forgive you, Mark. That was stupid what you said in the sermon way back then, but, you know. But uh, I'm serious. There's there's a lot of bad ideas out there. This is a meme that some of you have seen, um, and it expresses a kind of truth. Um, I, this is not, this is, there's something about this picture that is not completely fair. Um, it's not fair to people named Karen. I know some, you know, women named Karen, and they're good people, and, but that name Karen has kind of been used for a certain kind of person. So that's not, the other thing that's not fair is this is kind of sexist, because if the first three are male, and the last one is female, as if, yeah, of course you... So, for you women here, forgive me, I'm not saying all of this is completely accurate, but I think you all recognize that there's a level of truth that this little picture, you know, communicates. Where we get our ideas, you know, not so much from books anymore. Okay, people don't read complete books to understand something completely. If we're lucky, people will read a good journal article. That's rare. Maybe a blog post. That's not so good. Or we just tweet. Okay. And that's where we get our ideas, and we think things through based on some tweet. And so if we're going to keep our heads, one of the things we need to ask ourselves is, who is this person who is saying this? Does this person really know? You know this is true in medical things, but you know some people, you know some of you, you know, you diagnose yourself by, by Google, okay? I'd, I'd suggest you not do that. And, you know, we have people studying medicine, you know, who are going to say, don't, you know, don't doctor yourself. You know, find an expert. And most of us know we, when it comes to our health, we want to find an expert, someone who's studied and has their credentials to have an opinion about your body, Okay? I talked a couple weeks ago about how we, we, we create labels for people. And one of the labels that's come up again, I think mainly in America, is elites. And people talk about the elites, and it's a negative thing. Oh, that's, that's the elites. You know, and I, I, I in some uh, Facebook conversation, I, I quoted some other Christian leader that I respect, and another guy that I had actually blocked years ago, was like, oh, he's one of those elites, one of those Christian elites. You know, and that was his way of saying, you need to blow them off. They're in that category of elites, and we're the common people. We really know the truth. Those elites, 
you know, they're kind of our enemy. And all I can think is, if you mean by elites, people who know what they're talking about. Okay, because that guy knew what he's talking about, this kind of expert. You know, because he's done the study and he's read the hundreds of books and conducted the hundreds of interviews. Okay, he has. He might know what he's talking about. You know, he might be the elite, but he's the elite because he's done his work. You know, use your head, find out who this person is who's saying something, and does this person have the credentials to, to say what he's saying? Do you have a reason to trust him? So these are the things that we are facing in the world, and it's what Timothy was facing 2,000 years ago. It's always been the same, and the advice is the same. Now, the truth is that bad ideas even if they're from good people, still have consequences. I just heard this week a story um, where people who grew up in church, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know the, all the details of what led to it, but one thing led to another, kind of embracing some strange ideas and distancing themselves from somebody. They went into the, some kind of lifestyle that might have seemed spiritual. But literally, people died, physically died. There were physical deaths because of bad ideas. And the problem is, everyone heard that story. These are church people, and what church did they go to? And so the church was discredited because of bad ideas. Okay, it's serious. We have to keep our heads and think straight. I want to give again an illustration that I gave about a year ago before any of us knew what this last year was going to be like. You know, 2020 was just a dream a year ago. Um, but it's about this ship called the Vasa. Um, there's a museum to this ship in Stockholm. If you ever go to Stockholm, it's one of the coolest museums ever. You need to visit that museum. But this ship, the Vasa, was um, built at a time when Riga was actually part of the Swedish Empire around the Baltic Sea, and this was a, a beautiful and powerful warship that was built, you know, in Stockholm, in kind of the Stockholm archipelago. Um, and it was an amazing ship, and it was going to, you know, show Sweden's dominance in the Baltic Sea. Um, and it had, <laughs> I mean, it, it's really comical, except, of course, some people died. But, it, like, it had, it it sailed literally a couple hundred meters and the wind hit it and it capsized and sunk to the bottom. It didn't even get into the Baltic Sea. It was just right there. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. And there it went down. You know, in, in seconds, it went down. And, and why did that happen? And probably it's due to a lack of of what was called in ships back then, ballast. And at the bottom of those ancient ships, you'd put stone or something that was very, very heavy. Okay, because of course a ship like that is very top heavy. Most of it is above the water and you've got those, you know, the, the sails that are catching wind. And so you need something to give it, you know, solidity in the water. Okay, and so that weight pulls it, it down and keeps it from being, going too far like that. It's called ballast, and you need to have enough of that, you know, and the taller your ship is, you know, then, then the more important that ballast is. And there's different ways boats do that. Now, flat boats maybe don't need it so much, but there's a centerboard or keel and different ways that, that does the same thing that keeps the boat from tipping over. And so for the, the Vasa, there was probably not enough ballast it looked beautiful. It might have even been too big and too beautiful. And it went over and it accomplished nothing and people died. We need ballast. And First and Second Timothy is all about ballast. Uh, Paul is saying we need in the church and Timothy needs to make sure it's there. So what is that ballast? Another um, good mentor of the church was John Wesley. There's... Um, uh, he was uh, Anglican, but founder of the Methodist Church. There's Lutheran pastors here who have that kind of collar. I've sometimes thought, 
maybe I should try that, a black robe and one of those collars. I'm, I'm not sure if that would be me, but I sometimes kind of want to want to try that. I just wear, you know, blue jeans underneath the robe, but just, anyway, that was a couple of hundred years ago, John Wesley. But one of the things Wesley was most known for was, was called the Wesley quadrilateral. That term doesn't matter. But he talked about um, sources of authority in our life. And these are kind of the four authoritative voices in the, our lives and in the church. There's scripture, but there's also reason, tradition, and experience. The reality is that all of them do have a voice of authority. Whether we like it or not, we're actually listening to some of these voices. Our, our experience determines how we see things, whether we like it or not. That's what I talked about a few weeks ago when I talked about the sins of the Father, where our, our, our culture determines what we see and how we think, and we read the Bible even through our culture, through our experience. So it affects us whether we accept it or not. It just does. But all of these play a role. And of course, as Christians, we think it's scripture, just scripture. And so some want to be super spiritual and say, all we need is scripture, brother. We don't need anything else, just scripture. Well, there's probably several things wrong with that, however spiritual that sounds. But, but one of them is simply this. Scripture might not ever be wrong, but our interpretation of scripture can certainly be wrong. Okay, it can certainly be wrong. And how can we figure out when our interpretation of Scripture is wrong? Only by listening to these other voices, the voice of reason and tradition and experience. And so all of these play a role in providing ballast. Again, Scripture is the highest authority. Okay, I mean, that's why most of our Sunday morning service is given to the sermon Okay, because that's we, we recognize that it's the voice of Scripture is the highest authority. Okay, but the reality is all of these are important, and we need to listen to the voices of Christian brothers and sisters. And if you have an idea that's like, you know, wow, no other Christian has ever thought this, there might be a reason no other Christian has thought that. You know, it might be because it's a pretty bad idea. It might not be wrong, but I'm just saying, if you've got some idea, no one else is saying that, look again at that idea. It might be a bad idea rather than everyone else is wrong. Okay? So if you're hearing some kind of new teaching and you find, oh, that's very different than anything that I've heard before, listen carefully and, you know, judge it, critique it. Now, I, I, I just realized just this second, you know, I'm... I might be setting myself up for a problem because we're going to be looking at the book of Revelation. And, um, you know, my approach to Revelation is going to be very different than what I was taught growing up. And I'm, I'm guessing it might be different than what every, most of you have heard, if you've ever heard anything about Revelation. But you need to listen and weigh my words. Don't, you know, don't believe what I say unless I make my case. I'm going to try to make my case about why this is the best way to understand the book of Revelation. But don't just believe me you know, even if everything that I've said before is 100% correct, I'm not saying it is, but even if that's true, I still could be wrong on this. So you still need to think carefully and weigh my words. No, but you do that based on what, what have other Christians believed and what does my reason tell me and what, does this fit my experience or not? And all of these play a role. And once again, Scripture is the ultimate authority, Okay, but only provided our interpretation of Scripture is correct. This is a gift of God in my mind, you know, to the church. So we, we have tradition. I'm not a traditionalist. It should be pretty obvious I'm not very traditional. I mean, this is why I don't wear a black robe and one of those big white ties because, you know, I just, this is, this is pretty much how I look all the time. You know, if I had a meeting with you this week, I'd probably look. Mark Sandberg just never really changes too much, you know. I'm, um, but... I'm not a traditionalist in church things too much, um, but tradition is important, okay? It's a voice we need to listen to and listen to our experience and listen to our head. Keep your head. So finally, Paul says this to Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, 
because you know those from whom you learned it. How from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. It's those Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed. It comes from God, ultimately. You know, as, as humans were writing, God was just active in that process. He was kind of breathing through them, energizing them as they're writing Scripture. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Teaching and rebuking, that probably is focusing on the world of ideas. Teaching the correct thing and rebuking the incorrect teaching. And then correcting and training in righteousness has to do about lifestyle. Correcting the wrong kind of lifestyle, you know, but teaching in the right kind of lifestyle. Earlier, Paul had told Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely. Life and doctrine. How you live and how you think. Pay attention to both of them. Watch your life and your doctrine carefully. Train yourself for godliness. And this is what we were talking about last week. There are things that we can do to provide ballast to remain steady in the midst of change and answering questions in these gray areas of life, you know, in, in you know, facing this marketplace of ideas, and teachers, good and bad, there, there are things that we can do and we, we are obligated to play an active role. That's another thing I talked about, uh, um, was it last week, two weeks ago? You know, God has designed us for an active role in what he is doing. There are things we can do proactively to guard our minds, to keep our heads. You know, there are disciplines of the word. There are disciplines of community. I, I'm, I'm not, I try not to be the kind of person where, you know, I just want bodies in chairs. I mean, I, I have to be honest, I, I do like it when people are here. I do like it when there's more people here. I, like I said, I'm especially happier when people have been gone, come back. And, and I, you know, as a pastor, I do feel better when there's more seats and seats, okay? But I'm not, I, I know that's not necessarily good. It's not about we just need to have higher attendance. And I, 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 I tend not to think about money. I don't concern myself too much with got to make sure people are putting stuff in the offering box. But I am concerned about people connected to the church. You need a connection to a body, whether it's communitas, or another church, whether it's to the church as a whole, or it might just be some group. But if you are distancing yourself from the body, it's always a bad sign. I mean, again, I mean, I've been around long enough that I've, I've seen this repeatedly. Either, um, either there's already something wrong, and so people distance themselves from other Christians, and it just gets worse, or for whatever reason, they just kind of distance themselves. They just get frustrated or angry or those Christians over there are weird and they kind of go on their own and it's always dangerous. It's always dangerous. Okay, we need some body of believers around us. We need the body. Once again, I'm not, I'm not talking about communitas. I hope, I truly hope communitas is a place where you can hold on and provide some ballast, but I'm not talking about communitas. I am talking about the body of Christ. And I'm talking about the word of God that has been given to us. And God has provided a way that we can keep our heads and we can walk faithfully in the world. And when the world, like I said, who is watching, sees us, they're drawn to us because in the midst of everyone is experiencing change and a lot of people are, what in the world are we supposed to do? Why can't we be the people who keep our heads? And people are looking around, who, who's got this figured out? Let the church of Jesus Christ, may we be the people who are figuring it out and leading people in a more steady path, being salt and light in that way. Let's pray.
Lord, even this morning, we've, we've experienced the gift of your body, and you've given people to us in the past, and though they are dead now, um, uh, their influence is still active. Thank you for uh, John Wesley. Thank you especially for Paul. Thank you for his faithfulness to the end. Thank you for his faithfulness to the truth. Thank you that you breathed into him truth that he could write for us. And you've given us what we need to navigate our way through this life successfully. So Lord, may we take the steps, may we keep our heads, and may we do this for the glory of God, for your kingdom, and for the sake of the nations around us. Amen.